Hey everybody, this is Birch, and a part of you know what I attempt to do with this channel, and and I mean it's it's probably one of the bigger goals, is to demystify some of the stuff that happens behind the scenes. No, not to give you gossip or tell you exactly what's going on. I don't often know myself, but I do have conversations with people. Half the time, when it's really good, juicy gossip, the uh, you know the rule is uh, you can't tell anyone, and I I do follow that rule. Even under this name, I I do follow that rule. So if somebody asks me not to share something, I don't. Uh, people who have shared things with me uh, who are listening to this right now can attest to that, uh, but they won't because it's all a secret. See, this is this is this uh, this is a double jeopardy situation I have myself in. Anyway, um, but there's a lot that goes on in comics that either there's misinformation on because uh, somebody speculated on something or an article was written and everybody took it as as truth, but it's not. Uh, or people are looking you know more into conspiracy aspects of what's going on and usually. You know, either you know, no time or incompetence is a is a pretty solid answer for most of the things that happen. Uh, but just try and uh, just trying to kind of explain why some of these things happen the way they happen. Not that it it makes it all okay. I think that's been a misunderstanding of people. I say, well, this is why these things happen. It's like, well, you so you think this is all right? I'm like, well, no, but here's the reasons why. So. <laughs> There's a, you know, being being informed as to why things are going astray doesn't make them going astray good. Uh, it just, you know, it, it means it's it's not some random act out of the void. Uh, but this question kind of uh, fits in line with those. So the question is, uh, uh, do Marvel DC editors know or even realize that all the nonstop events, miniseries, scheduling problems, reboots, relaunches, and price hikes, and other bad business decisions are the reasons that many of the normies, likely a vast majority of their readerships, are quietly leaving and going over to manga. I feel like for the past couple of years, they basically allowed themselves to turn into a snake eating its own tail non-stop. Or is this simply a case of them not knowing how the publishing industry actually works and them just suffering a case of the Peter Principle? Um... Well, it's more that last one. I, I think so. A couple things about how editorial uh, seems to work, and and in this case, there's some really good uh, interviews that have happened uh, in the past around editors at Marvel DC back in the uh, the 80s that are on this channel, and I suggest you look you listen to them. They're they're very illuminating because they do portray a world of how editorial worked that uh, seems to be very different today. Uh, the biggest change, and I think it then feeds into a lot of your, your questions here, is that editorial used to be more uh, centrally organized. And, and what I mean by that is that there was more coordination between editors. There was more of an attempt for one editor to reach out to another editor. There was just there was more internal communication, and there was more of a sense that that needed to occur in order to do the job properly. Um, what's interesting is several of the interviewees that, uh, that we, we've had talk about how great Tom Brevoort in particular was at bringing new people on and also coordinating, uh, with things, how they were, they were really good at, uh, you know, having, having really tight, good coordination. Um, but, uh, if you, if you look at the company today and you look at even the, uh, the, you know, the responses that you see publicly from a lot of the editors, that coordination is uh, not happening nearly at the level it used to. And maybe part of the clue is they've, they've started to do writer summits. They have these, these gatherings, um, and they talk about the reason to do the gathering is to get us all together in one place and actually communicate about our upcoming plans. Now, that sounds like a good idea, and, and it is, but you contrast that with what we've heard on interviews of, of editors who worked back in, in, say, the 80s, where they say, uh, you know, every day, every week, was a day where they were coordinating on plans that uh, there was not, there weren't special moments. There weren't special summits. The special summits were everybody would out, go out and get a drink Friday night. Uh, but during the week, there was this constant uh, communication, constant coordination about what was happening in titles. And so why I think that plays heavily into your question is when you talk about mini series and relaunches and characters being used and events and everything else, um, there's not a good handle on who's doing what. You may remember from one of those interviews, there was a conversation about um, how you know Marvel would keep an eye on DC and vice versa because they wanted to be conscious about 
counter programming. If one company was doing an event, they would ma- want to make sure that they were doing you know certain activities to uh, basically not not get caught up in that event or not lose market share because the other company was doing something. They were trying to do things to to battle back that. And today that that does not occur and and it's pretty common and I can tell you from from firsthand conversations with editors at both companies uh, there isn't uh, it, many editors are unaware of what's going on in another line they're unaware you know the, the, the person editing Star Wars is unaware of the events that are rolling out in the Avengers line and so if they're doing an event and they're doing a crossover and the Avengers are doing a crossover it all just happens at the same time and you know nobody thinks much about it and there became some some tribal wisdom which is almost 180 degrees the opposite of that logic that we you know that we heard about back in the 80s around counter programming wanted to make sure you weren't flooding the market with too much of the same thing um, in many cases there's this certainty within editors that you know a a person picking up the Star Wars comics is definitely not picking up the Spider-Man comics, who is definitely not picking up the Avengers comics. These are all different different readers. These are different people doing those things. And that logic is flawed on two fronts. Uh, number one, it's actually pretty likely that a Marvel reader is reading multiple lines, not just the X-Men. It's pretty likely that that, that same reader is also picking up some Spider-Man, some Captain America, and some Star Wars, and some other things. They're not all mutually exclusive lines, quite the contrary. The other piece, though, is that the, uh, the invisible customer, if you will, to the publisher, is the retailer. The retailer is the one buying the books, making the orders, and then marketing and pushing those on their customers. And if you confuse the retailer, meaning you've got too many events, the retailer is going to basically pick the event that he or she thinks is going to do the best, and they're going to largely ignore the rest. They're uh, not not ignore, but just that there's definitely going to be a different level of hype and promotion inside the store. And so what you'll see is the the, the retailer uses a, a increasingly simple metric of, well, who's the artist first? Who's the writer? Do the characters have buzz? That's going to be the uh, the event that I order big on. So, for example, King in Black, okay. Stegman is a is a hot property. Hates is a hot property. Venom is selling well. I'm going to order big on that one, and I'm going to kind of ignore you know whatever cosmic event we have going on, the last annihilation or or what have you. Those two, I know the King and Black came first, and the last annihilation came le- later. But that's that's how this thought process goes. And increasingly, comic retailers are also doing that comparison, not just within Marvel, but within Marvel and DC. So it's like, well, what's DC got going? It's like, well, you know, DC's got a, another crisis event. Who's the artist on it? I, they haven't advertised for it. Josh Williamson is doing it. Well, okay, he's he's all right. What's Marvel have going on? Well, they've got this, uh, you know, they've got this Devil's Reign event. It's like, uh, okay, probably Devil's Reign. I know a little bit more about it. I'll push that more. That's how that logic goes in the store. Now, you could say that's unfair, and I've talked to editors who say that's completely unfair, but my question is, why do you expect the retailer to do more work researching and evaluating what's going on in the line and and who's got what so they could market each event separately and uniquely? Why would you expect the retailer to do that work when the editors are not willing to do that work, when they're not coordinating with each other? And it's, it's really common that you hear from editors, I don't know what's going on in that line over there. I, I don't know. The conversations between editors these days seem to be a lot more along the lines of, hey, well, who are good freelancers to work with? Who are good contractors that you like? I need somebody to fill in for this book. Do you have anyone that you've been, you know, that you've got? And, and granted, that is part of the job of editorial, but managing the line is arguably a at least uh, <laughs> as, as important, I would argue, a lot more. Because what happens is these things all feel like a cluster. You have events all on top of each other. You have mini series that seem you know poorly planned and coordinated. You have uh, you know comics ending and beginning. You have characters showing up in one book and then showing up in another, doing completely different things and, and with a different personality. That's that's a major problem. And to, to give you a sense of, of how broken it is, uh, the X-Men line 
uh, is probably one of the tighter controlled in the sense that you do have an editor there, of course, you have an assistant editor, but you also have a, a Slack channel that's used for communication that, that people are coordinating. The team itself brags about doing Zoom calls and other things to stay in sync. And yet, when you read those comics, there, there's frequent moments where they don't feel in sync either. So who's doing the job? And, and that one's maybe a little scarier in the sense that, you know, previously the editor was coordinating. Now we're hearing that, you know, a combination of Jonathan Hickman, well, not anymore, and the other writers are coordinating for themselves. And so what, what is, is, is editorial taking an even further backseat? What kind of habits is this building up for the future? That's, that's where this system is broken. Uh, all of this is, is frustrating, but to me, the thing that gets me most angry about it or, or what, what really tips me over about this entire business is that the commentary that you do see from editors often the most on social media is either you know, diving into some dumb ass feud about comics gate or trolls or some other stupid shit. And, and honestly, there, who cares? In 2022, who cares about this stuff? If you're making comics under that label, good for you. But if you're an editor, why are you bothering? You've, you've blocked the majority of the principles. What's the point? What are, what, what are you doing with your time? Why is that more valuable than, say, coordinating the line you manage? But anyway, I got off track a little bit. That's annoying. But the, the one that, that is the most annoying to me at all, uh, to, of, of them all, is editors complaining about how busy they are and how they can't answer email because they're too busy. Or, oh, my God, I'm just not going to turn on the computer today because it's, so, it's, oh, it's just too much to do. Too much to do. Um, not only is that incredibly unprofessional to, to just put out there in a public forum that you're you know, basically incapable of doing your job, but what kind of message does that send to the creatives that you're working with, to the retailers that are ordering from you, and from the customers that are going to buy those books? That you're just, ah, oh, you're having a bad day because it's just too busy. I mean, in this instance, God bless Jordan White, who posts photos of him playing the ukulele. I, I, I have to give him that credit. Um, you know, he, he uh, White does not post these messages about how much of a pain in the ass his job is. And... I, that is a low bar, but but good for him. He 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 at least does that. So many editors right now are just oh so busy. Ah, ugh. Heather Anto is like I'm coming back from New Year's, and there's so many emails in my inbox. Oh, what a terrible day. Oh God, you know Chris Conroy like oh ah, what this this job is so hard. I'm so tired all the time. I can't even. I oh, I hate email. I hate. I just don't want to answer anything. That's where I'm at right now. I'm like, ugh, come on. I mean, I, I'll, I'll take the fighting with, you know, d d whatever online troll you're fighting over that. That stuff is just the worst. I, I hate it. And the fact that simultaneously you have books coming out late and, and this stuff just all over the place. Yeah, it, it's, what's, what's the phrase? Not a good look. Not a good look, not helpful for everyone. And and again, note what I said before. Everybody always focuses on the fans and customers when we talk about this stuff. Oh, the fans and the customers are having a hard time on social media with these people. You know who it's worse for? Yeah, the other creators. The what about the independent contractor who is, you know, uh, sent you a pitch months ago or weeks ago? Or is waiting to hear back on whether they got a gig or, you know, the end of their contract is coming up, uh, you know, in a couple issues and they don't know if they're going to get extended or not. How are those people feeling when they have to go to your social media feed and see you like, oh, oh, ouchies, I've uh, I drank too much last night and I'm not going to do any email today. I'm so tired. Oh, God, how, how how are you? How are you? How are your own team members, your own collaborators feeling about this? Yeah, forget the fans for a moment. You're you're failing at, at working with your own people, let alone the retailers who are who are you know picking and choosing what to order out of all this and going, well, this just all looks terrible. Anyway, um, it's frustrating. Thank you for the question. Um, I, the answer is yeah, the, the editors don't know, and it chases away everyone, and it, it's a corrosive effect because the uh, the retailers order less. 
the customers buy less. It's, it's, you know, it's a chain of events that happens. It's negative. And I, they, some of them are leaving to go to manga as the question said, for sure. Others are just leaving. They're going to, they're leaving for Netflix or they're leaving for, you know, some other hobby or they're just, you know, they're not leaving, but they're, you know, rather than buying 10 comics a month, they're buying two. I, I a lot of people get extreme and it's a video for another time, which I'll do, but a lot of people get extreme about, oh, these people are quitting comics. But the reality is very few people quit comics. They just take what they're buying from 10 or 20 books a month down to two or three. And you could say, oh, well, they're still supporting Marvel, so Marvel wins. No, no, not at all. When you're buying 10% of what you used to buy, you're, you're hurting that company. You, you are absolutely, it, that is not a healthy place to be. It's, it doesn't have to go to zero to hurt. Going from 20 to two is a, is a big deal. And I see a lot of that happening. Anyway, let me know your thoughts in the comments below. And thanks for listening.